So good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with y'all. Uh, this is my first year participating as a volunteer in the National Society of Sales Engineering Conference and Competition. Um, I've been in the industry for about 25 years. Um, and uh, in addition to being a mentor to a couple of teams, uh, I volunteered to run this session as well. Um, so I'm going to just say it right up front. Uh, you know, if you have questions, please, by all means, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A window. Uh, I'll try to get to all of them. Uh, you know, when I was coming up with these, uh, with this content, uh, I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit flummoxed on how to approach it. I didn't want to just make it a, a, a giant list of questions. Um, and certainly there's not a super lot of time to, you know, do a bunch of role plays, which, you know, I thought about and would have been interesting. Uh, so, so I kind of settled on something of a meta session, right? How to make the most of your meetings. And of course, there's a focus here on asking questions, but there's a healthy emphasis on how do you know what questions to ask and how do you prepare yourself to ask those questions. So, so hopefully we hit the mark. Um, by all means, if uh, you know, please provide feedback before, after, during. I'd love to have this conversation. And honestly, what we're doing right here is one of the parts of the job I enjoy the most. I love communicating. I love talking with people. I love educating. I love presenting. And with that, so who, who am I? Uh, I'm Tom, I've been with VMware. I was originally hired in 2007. Uh, I did take a short hiatus in the intervening 14, 13 years. I worked over at EMC for a few years. I was an SE at Citrix uh, before all of that. I have a, a healthy adoration of Star Wars. I've got three dogs, four kids lots of certifications, and I am actually, I actually do have an education as a singer, which is obviously not what I have pursued. <laughs> uh, I wanna be able to talk about, I wanna get to four things here. Um, you know, when I, as I said, when I was preparing this content, I was, I was a little bit stumped at first. And so I tried to approach this from the perspective of, you know, where was I? 25 years ago, right? I mean, there are, you, you've got the benefit of lots of industry veterans uh, on the phone here with us now uh, throughout your, your, your time and exposure to the competition um, with the judges, with the mentors, with the other speakers. And, and obviously we have the benefit of years of experience behind us. And as I just shared with you, I went to school for music. I didn't have an engineering degree in anything. Um, so, I, I tried to approach this from the perspective of what was it, what is it that I think, or what, what do I remember about needing to learn over the years? And that was helped along by my experiences mentoring a couple of the teams this year. Um, they refreshed my memory on some of the things that I had to learn. So I wanna talk about preparation, right? How do you prepare for a meeting? Uh, and the, the the benefit of preparing for a meeting, obviously, is you don't walk in cold, right? You, it's not your customer's job to do your homework for you. Um, obviously, we need to be able to understand the opportunity. And a, a good emphasis of the past week or two with regards to the first role play has been all about, hey, how do we kind of wrap our heads and our hands around what's going on with Liberty Mutual. How do we understand that? Once you start to understand the problems that the customer is facing, there's always a phase where you have to dig deeper. I generically refer to this as discovery or investigation, um, but invariably, once you've identified the business challenges that the customer is trying to address, there's gonna be obstacles. 
or, or challenges that the customer has to overcome. And some of those obstacles and challenges will be business-like in nature, uh, you know, contractual obligations, compliance requirements, security regulations. Some of them are going to be highly detailed and technical in nature. And of course, that's where we as uh, sales engineers really shine, right? Um, now, even, even once you've understood the opportunity and you've gotten all the details out of it, you're not necessarily gonna win the business, right? You still need to be able to align your, yourself, your team, your solution, and your company to the customer. And, and what does that mean? And it's, it's, it's not, as, not nearly as mysterious as it might sound, right? So I've kind of broken it into these three phases. How do we understand the opportunity? How do we solve the problem? And there's a, a heavy expectation, of course, that the problem was going to be technical in nature in some form or fashion, which can be solved or helped or alleviated in some way, shape or form by the solution that we're representing or by the company that we're working for. And then of course, how do we align to the customer? Now, I wanted to start first with what do all of us, what do we bring to the table? Um, because, you know, none of us walk in completely blind, except maybe perhaps on your very, 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 very first actual appointment with a customer for the first time ever in your career. That might be the first time you feel like you're walking in blind, but literally every meeting after that, you've got experience to build on. And so obviously as, you're, as you grow in your career, you're gonna develop, you're going to develop a, uh, you know, call it a, a quiver of arrows, right? A, an arsenal of stories, of anecdotes, of, of problems you've seen and solved previously. And it, while it is true that not necessarily every customer and every customer problem is the same, Trust me when I tell you that a lot of them are very, very similar in nature. So the more experience you have, obviously, the more you're going to grow as a sales engineer. That's a given. And you bring all of that with you. With regards to your role, uh, you, you know, John, for those of you who watched John's first couple of sessions, he referred to it a couple times. Uh, very frequently, we as sales engineers are partnered with an account executive, a salesperson. And th there is to some degree a division of labor. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I tend to leave it to my sales rep to worry about things like contractual obligations and licensing entitlements and pricing and discounting. And, you know, how are we actually gonna close the deal? Now, now that doesn't mean that doesn't certainly uh, alleviate my responsibility to understand those things. But there are certain things that I know as a two-person team, I may not be primarily responsible for. And yes, uh, Mahul, I see your question in the q and I'll try in the chat, I'll try to get to that as well. Um, Thirdly, there's your solution. Now I work for VMware. So that means I represent a very specific portfolio of solutions. And during the course of my work with customers, have I had to learn about say EMC storage solutions and data protection? Of course I have. Have I had to work with Palo Alto on firewall solutions. Of course I have, but those are ancillary. And in terms of technical depth, I'm deep on the VMware portfolio, right? So, so the things in green you bring with you. And as you grow in your career, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff there that you bring with you. And why is that important when it comes to asking questions? Because of course, while, you know, it. You, you may not be able to solve every problem. I work for VMware. We don't have 
certain things in our bag of tricks, right? So there's certain solutions I'm not gonna be able to solve for, certain problems I'm not gonna be able to solve for. And as an SA or an SE, there are certain things I'm not gonna be able to help with. Now, in terms of your customer, as I said, it's not your customer's job to do your homework for you. So the things in blue are things you can learn ahead of time, right? And there's been a lot of emphasis on this in the in terms of the role plays with Liberty Mutual. What is their business model? What are the industry trends? These are things you can find out without necessarily ever having to talk to the customer. And it's important that you do so because if the very first thing you do walking into a meeting, the very first questions that you ask of your customer who might be an executive is, well, you know, tell me about your business. That's gonna decrease their level of trust in you, right? You can demonstrate some industry knowledge, some basic understanding of their business that's gonna increase their level of trust in you, right? Now, finally, of course, during your meeting, you have to address the specific needs of your audience. And we'll talk about that more. And we of course need to address what the customer problem is. And those are things that you're there to learn about, right? So when I talk about what do you bring to the table, certainly just based on your role, your solution, your experience, you're going to have a whole set of technical depth that will inform how you approach digging into the details. And that's gonna be unique to you, your role and your solution. With regards to your customer, you can do homework to figure out what the business model and the industry trends are. Now, how about where you can learn more about your customer, right? So when we talk about industry trends, when we talk about your customer's business model, there are lots of sources of information that are available today that were not always available, whether it's LinkedIn or Indeed, company website, of course, news articles, a 10K report, annual, annual report. And right, not every customer is a public facing customer, right? Not every customer is uh, trades on the, on the market. So a publicly traded company. So they may not all have a 10K, but they'll probably have an annual report or some other kind of financial disclosure on a yearly basis. And I wanna draw your attention to the last couple, uh, partners, resellers, other vendors. You know, early days in my year, my career at VMware, uh, you know, I, did, I was introduced to a new set of customers I didn't know a lot about, but I happened to have some friends that worked at Cisco and they had been dealing with some of these customers for years. So I just went out to lunch a few times with my buddies at Cisco and talked about some of these customers to learn more about the business model, some of the things they've been working on and, and where our solutions as VMware might apply, right? So you've got a network of contacts, you've got oodles of information that's publicly available on the internet and you have coworkers. And all of these are great sources of information. And, and why, again, why is this important? Not just, not just so that you do your homework, but you, so that you can ask more intelligent and informed questions, right? Now, finally, before your first meeting, I, I recommend doing some analysis on your solution, your company, where you think you might run into issues with your customer. Uh, a SWOT analysis is one way to do this. There's a, you know, there's a healthy couple handfuls of analysis techniques on the internet. If you haven't heard of a SWOT analysis, SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's a matrix, as you can see on the screen, that just allows you to kind of walk through what you know your strengths are, what you know areas of improvement might be, certain areas of opportunity that you might be able to help with, 
Say, for example, you happen to work for a high tech firm that does a lot of work with cloud and, and, and uh, hyperscaler solutions, and you happen to have a customer that is trying to develop a new application like Liberty Mutual, right? There's some huge opportunity there, and you know that there's some opportunity there. And then there's always threats, right? Who, who might your competition be? What are some risks that you might have with that customer? This is always a useful exercise to go through. I'm not gonna belabor it any further. We do have a reference at the back. Now, now with regards to asking the right questions, and, and, and I would argue, it's not that there's ever a wrong question to ask, but you can certainly misstep, right? I think about it in a tiered approach. And, and it is not true that you will always start at the top and work your way down. The case study that they have put together for you for this competition is a really nice, broad, sweeping case study that affects the entire portion, you know, the entire business at Liberty Mutual and their business goals, right? In terms of how are they going to attack market share and everything. That's not always the case, right? Your, your customers, they set out goals for themselves, for their shareholders. Uh, those goals require initiatives to achieve those goals. Those initiatives usually have pretty broad sweeping impact across your customer. There will be initiatives and goals in many, if not all departments to meet those goals, right? So, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about this framework fairly frequently at VMware, right? You've got a business goal, you create initiatives to reach that, reach that goal, that then creates goals for your departments your departments then create initiatives to reach those goals. And then there are individual projects, tasks, and goals, and so forth. Now, why is this important? This is probably self-evident. Uh, this gets back to what John was talking about earlier today with regards to tying everything together, right? So if you are engaged in a project with your customer, if and you can tie your solution to an, a higher level goal, you've increased your value to that solution for that customer, right? Now, now sometimes you're gonna be tasked with something that is very technical in detail. And so there may not be a straight line of sight to a business goal, but if you can place it in the context of the larger initiatives of the company, even if there's a chain of them, then again, you will have increased your value. Now, now, why is this interesting or why is this important for your audience? Well, because generally speaking, the CIO, COO, CEO of the company is not gonna care about running out of disk space on an individual drive, right? That's gonna be somebody down in the individual contributor, somebody down in the administration team. So generally speaking, this is not always true, but generally speaking, your technical depth will come into play the lower in the org you go, right? So when you're talking to a C-level executive or a, or a director or a VP, your questioning needs to be much more focused on business level objectives and initiatives, maybe departmental level object objectives and initiatives. Over time, you will be required to do some discovery on the technical detail. And usually you will work with a team or an individual that has deep knowledge of the challenge that you're running into there. Now, let me just give you an example, right? Now, this is not a Liberty Mutual example. You've got that one already. So this is actually an example from a customer of mine from about five years ago, happens to be a financial services firm I've kept their name out of it to protect the innocent. But about five, six years ago, they had a business goal to increase market share in the credit, uh, credit financial services industry through innovation and unique partnering in the industry, right? Now we've, we've talked a lot over the past couple of weeks 
I'm sure many of you have with your mentors around, hey, how do I find out more about that? What kind of questions do I have? And I've got some examples of those as well. That created an initiative for them. All right, well, how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna increase market share? How are we gonna partner in the industry in, a, in an innovative fashion? Well, they decided they were going to establish partnerships with consumer marketplaces. Think about things like the Discover Card or Amazon Web Services or Amazon, right? The Amazon Web Store or Barnes and Noble Bookstore, right? To drive consumer behavior through differentiated customer experience and value, this created goals for them in the IT department. How are they going to create partnerships with those consumer marketplaces? How will we give our customers differentiated value? They decided they were going to develop an API portal and work with some of those marketplaces and other retail vendors to provide an integrated mobile experience for differentiated experience for their customers, which meant that the IT team had to help build a new API portal with their developers. And that generated, as you can imagine, uh, a number of individual projects and tasks. Now we were involved in several of those projects, but knowing the full context of why we were doing it enabled to ask questions in a more intelligent fashion. Why are you building this API portal? How do you expect your partner, your partners in the ecosystem to integrate with your financial services? Tell me more about what you're doing with that API portal. Now for every project or initiative, you're gonna go through this cycle of what are you doing? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? Now this is where spin or the five whys, or as one of my mentees mentioned to me the other day, I hadn't heard of this one, the pain funnel, right? This is where these things come into play. What are you doing? Why are you doing it, right? What's the impact of doing this or not doing it? And how does it work today? How does it need to change? Now, I'm not gonna give you a giant list of questions. And, and the reason for that, I think, should also be self-evident. You need a strategy for understanding what a successful meeting looks like. And somebody asked this earlier today, and John mentioned, John addressed it, right? You need a strategy for what you want to get out of the meeting. And while it is absolutely good, yes, to come up with a list of questions, you can't get caught up on just asking all the questions, right? You need a strategy for get your information, but you need to have a conversation with your customer. Now, for those of you who are familiar with SPIN, right, a typical meeting cycle, and we saw some of this in the role play, build rapport, you understand what the situation is, you dig into the problem, you try to understand the impact of that problem, and then you position a new outcome, a new future. Wouldn't it be easier if? What would it look like if? How will this change your business? How will this enable your goals, right? And then you have your meeting close. Okay, well, great. Thanks so much for the time today. Here are the action items. When are we going to meet again, et cetera. Now, I've put it in this graphic like this because it's highly unlikely that you're going to get this all done in one meeting. Right, so, so one of the questions in the Q&A is, how does one balance keeping with time and still getting all the information you need? And the answer is frequently, you don't. We, we run out of time on, in meetings all the time. Um, so there's a few techniques to handle. First of all, you manage the agenda of the meeting closely to keep the agenda tight so that you can get to the things you want. That's number one. And number two, during the close, if there's anything you haven't gotten to, make sure somebody owns it as an action item. Hey, right, Mahu, great to talk to you today. I'm so sorry we didn't get to these items. I'm gonna send you an email. Would you mind you know, helping me out with a few pieces of additional information? 
great, thank you. But I put it in this fashion in the graphic because you're going to have multiple meetings. And typically, there's usually a long chain of email conversation going on as well, right? Now I put in some sample questions here. Uh, I'm not gonna read through the questions because again, I, I, I don't wanna make this session about what are questions you should ask. The questions you need to ask will change with every customer, with every project, with every meeting, with every solution, right? Um, <clears throat> I do want to say, though, it is a highly iterative process. You know, those of you who are familiar with the Scrum framework, you'll probably recognize this logo. This is a typical Scrum uh, methodology, but it's useful for this because, you know, especially in a big project like the one you're addressing with Liberty Mutual, you're going to have multiple meetings. Right. So I'm, for example, I'm involved with a cloud sale right now with a large university. Uh, we just finished a, a, a month long pilot. Uh, they're in the process of looking at sizing and configurations and pricing. Um, we've already identified their business use cases and the success criteria, et cetera. Uh, but the deal's not going to close till May. Right, so because it's a multi-million dollar year uh, deal, it's not something you can do inside of a week or a month, right? Deals like this size, multi-million dollar deals, they typically take a long time to close. And therefore there's gonna be multiple meetings. So uh, it's a little unfair, right? I mean, in some ways the, the role play is a little unfair because they're compressing what would typically take multiple meetings and lots of time into three meetings over two days. And each of those meetings is only 20 minutes long, right? So just keep in mind with regards to the role play specifically, keep in mind some of the things that Sam said at the, you know, during one of John's sessions. Nobody's expecting you to be industry experts now, right? Nobody's expecting you to have mastery of the solution today. As you work through with your customer though, you're going to be having multiple meetings and you do want to be setting an agenda for those meetings. You do want to be setting success criteria for yourself for those meetings so that you know if you're making progress or not. Now, while I'm on this slide, um, somebody else asked in the Q and A, uh, I would love to hear how you over uh, how you ask questions in two scenarios. Number one, overcoming a difficult objection, and number two, when you have no idea when the when when you uh, when you have no idea what the customer is saying, or you feel like you're over your skis. So I'll take the second one first. If you have no idea what the customer is saying, well, nobody expects. I mean, you, it, it is. I consider humility being humble with your customer to be one of your most powerful and important skills. Nobody wants to do business with somebody who's super arrogant and boastful and is a know-it-all, right? Nobody even wants to talk with that person. And I'm sure everybody on the phone here knows somebody like that. So if you're feeling over your skis, you're feeling like you have no idea what they're talking about, just ask for clarification. Wow, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Can you clarify what you mean, please? Or if you just straight up don't know the answer, it's okay to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Can I get back to you? That's a perfectly acceptable answer. The, the key is to make sure you follow through. If, if you ask for clarification and then you tell your customer, well, I'm gonna have to you know, do a little research on that and follow up, make sure you do it. Because if you don't actually do your research and then follow up, then that's a great way to not get asked back. Uh, now, the other question is, how do you overcome a difficult objection? Uh, and you know, there's a lot of, um, 
social interaction, right? And I think last week during during the uh, the keynote speech, uh, the keynote session, I think Sam or or somebody else said, you know, this is a social this is a social career, and that's actually one of the reasons why I really like it. Overcoming objections takes just as much art as it does skill, especially if your customer is, you know, uh, combative in some way. And I always find it easiest, number one, to, to try and put my customer at ease. And I use phrases like, you know, if I have a customer who seems to be really defensive or combative, I have used phrases like, gee, Crystal, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make you defensive. I'm just trying to get some information. I apologize if I'm being offensive in some way, right? So being humble, using your own humility to lower the temperature in the room is, I've never found it to fail me, okay? Uh, that's number one. Oh, Dylan, I'll answer your question in just a second. Um, and the other, the other thing I would say about overcoming a difficult objection is, you know, usually I would say objections fall into two categories, uh, things that you can actually change and things that you can't. And if it's something you can have an impact on, like the price of the solution uh, or if it's, uh, you, you know, maybe they're asking you about something that is not your, you know, it's something that you're, you can fix, but it's not a product that you've been thinking about. Maybe you just need to pause and say, well, hey, you know what, that's a great idea. Let me think about that. Maybe we're not looking at the right solution. Um, but usually, as I said, objections fall into one of two categories, things you can change and things you can't. And if they're things you can't change, then obviously you don't wanna just, you know, throw your hands up and walk away. You may have to defer while you think about a response. You may have to, um, you know, lower the temperature in the room. You may have to sometimes just say, well, gosh, you know, I'm really sorry to hear you say that because um, that's not something we can work on. There's, but there's a lot of ways to, to handle that. Um, and you know, I'll try to put in some additional links for objection handling. Um, now, Dylan asked, what does LOB stand for? Line of business, right? So for example, in an insurance company, you will probably have a line of business that is responsible for automobile insurance. You'll probably have a line of business that's responsible for uh, life insurance, probably have a line of business that's responsible for homeowners insurance, but that's what LLB stands for, line of business. Uh, so moving on. So, in a, so that's, you know, when we think about understanding the opportunity, obviously there's going to be some kind of problem statement. It's either going to be a business problem statement or a technical problem statement, but there's going to be a problem statement and understanding what that means to the customer understanding, you know, what is it? Why is that important to the customer? How are they dealing with it today? Those are all aspects of digging in to the details of the opportunity itself, right? Asking those probing questions. And, and again, uh, there's lots of resources out there on what those probing questions could be, but they're gonna be unique for your company, your solution, your customer and their problem, right? When it comes to aligning with the customer, right? So you, you've identified the problem. Hopefully you're representing a solution and a company that can help fix the problem. So you've wrapped your arms around what the problem is and how you might be able to fix it. When it comes to aligning with the customer, you can also think of this as framing the opportunity, right? Understanding the boundaries. Is it a real opportunity? Do we have an identified need? Yes, right, we know what the problem statement is. Is there a timeline to fix this? Um, some kind of compelling event? Is there something forcing the customer into action? Uh, a compelling event on the timeline could be anything from a contract renewal to hardware or software expiring in its support to um, 
physical constraints, like we have a lease on a building that's up, or to something uh, much more market driven, like the window of opportunity in getting into the Asia market is closing. I already know that Geico and Progressive are trying to get into the Asia market. We've got an advantage there. I think we have a window based on our own analysis of about 18 months to deploy this, you know, a set of new agents and new applications into the into the Asia Pacific Rim, right? So there's usually a timeline. So you've got a need, you've got a timeline, and then of course there's a budget. How exactly? How exactly? Uh, are you going to pay for this, right? If you've got a need, like, boy, my car is breaking down. I have to change, you know, I have to, you know, got a flat tire every week because I, you know, driving through a bed of nails on my way to work every day. Well, that's obviously a, a need. Timeline, when do you need it? Well, I drive to work every day. I'm changing a flat every day. Do you have money to buy a new car? No. Do you have money to uh, fix the road? No. Well, you're not, you're not going to get very far then, right? So every opportunity has a need or a pain point that needs to be fixed. Uh, it is usually time bound in nature. And the customer needs to have identified a budget for it. And now this one, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an SE, I find this one the most challenging to, to address personally, because as I said, I'm usually part of a two person team and usually my account rep is responsible for things like budget, financing, discounting, contracts, et cetera. So I, I find this one personally challenging to, to address, but it doesn't have to be. It can be as simple as, have you allocated a budget for this? Can you share with me what that budget is? Obviously, if the customer hasn't taken the time to set aside money to fix the problem, the likelihood of them doing so is pretty low. Now, in addition to that, you do need to know how is the deal gonna go down? And this has everything to do with customer behavior and process. And I will tell you, I have seen lots of deals go sideways or tank because we as a sales team did not fully understand the process. Who are they gonna buy from? Is this gonna be a direct deal between Liberty and Dell? Are they gonna buy it through a reseller? Are they gonna buy it through their relationship with Accenture? Because Accenture happens to be a reseller in, for Dell Technologies. Are they gonna do some other kind of third party contract vehicle? This is very common in state and local uh, government, right? Uh, and federal government. There are contract vehicles in place set up for the state. And if you're not on the contract, it doesn't matter how much they like your, your solution. They can't buy it because you're not on the contract for the state. How are they gonna buy this? Is this a one-time deal? Are they just gonna cut you a purchase order? It, are, are they required to put this out to bid through an RFP, right? And if you're not familiar with what an RFP is, a request for proposal, it's a highly formalized way to ensure multiple vendors get a fair shot at understanding the problem and responding to it. It's literally, usually, a document. Nowadays, it's electronic. It's an electronic document, like a PDF, sometimes 50 pages, 100 pages long that lays out all the requirements and everybody has a chance to respond to it. And then the company usually down selects. So, okay, well, we got 30 responses. We're gonna down select to five and then those five will be invited in for a proof of concept or whatever, right? So it's just gonna be, hey, you know, we went out to lunch a few times. I know the CIO, he's already promised me the deal. We're good. Or do they have to put it out as an RFP? Or is this some kind of enterprise agreement? Right, like pretty much every company in existence has some kind of enter EA enterprise agreement with Microsoft that ha they have to renew every three years. Lots of companies have similar types of agreements with other large vendors. Certainly at VMware, we have a healthy set of our customers that have an enterprise licensing agreement with us. And very frequently those are renewed on an annual or every three years basis. 
And then finally, you know, once you know who they're going to buy from and how they're going to buy it, who has the rights to do it? Who's going to influence that, right? Who are the people you need to cozy up to in the account and help convince them that you can fix all their technical problems, right? So there's usually some influencers that will have some technical authority to say, yes, this will fix the problem. No, it won't. Yes, this will fix the problem, but I don't like your solution. I prefer this solution. Who has to approve the deal? Right? Usually, if, especially if it's a multi-million dollar deal, there are several levels of approvals that it has to go through. And somebody has to be able to sign it. I, usually, you know, if you think back to, um, where is it? Right. If you think back to this slide, usually even departmental managers have some level of signing authority. A few thousand, several thousand, couple ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars signing authority. But a departmental head probably does not have the authority to sign a fifteen million dollar deal. Right, that's going to be someone much higher up in the organization. So when we talk about how will the deal go down, you need to know and you need to be able to ask, who are you gonna buy from? Is this gonna be a direct deal with us? Are you going through distributors, third party contract? How are you gonna buy? One time purchase order? You cut us a check and we're done? Are you gonna put it out to bid for an RFP? Is it an enterprise agreement? And what's the process? And that one, that last one is really important. Because if you do not respect the right person's authority on how the deal gets done, you will not get the deal done. So to close, and I know some of you may be walking away thinking this isn't quite the presentation you expected. But again, as I said, I, I thought about, you know, how do I best prepare these teams to think about getting the most out of their meetings? Right, sales engineering is competitive. You're always in competition, right? But it's a lot like soccer or football as the rest of the world knows it. For those of you who've played football, soccer, uh, or hockey, or field hockey, or basketball. All of those sports share something in common. The minute the puck or the ball hits the court, all the plans are off. You can have all the strategy you want. But as Mike Tyson used to say, Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, or as I don't remember what general it was, it was actually originated with a general, I wanna say General Patton, I could be wrong. I, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. All bets are off, but that's why this is a team sport. There is a skill to this, yes. There's an art to this as well. And over time, your experience, as you grow in your role, you develop those stories, you develop some of those techniques, your intuition on how to react in all those situations will grow and develop as well. But remember, it's a team sport. You are, in my case, I have never not been partnered. In other words, I have always been partnered with an account executive. It's a team sport. Right, the deals and the technology are too big and too complex to go out and do on your own sometimes. Last thing I wanna leave you with, and then we'll open it up for any additional questions. Last thing I wanna leave you with, and I do see there are one or two more questions in the chat. Um, remember to be genuine. And I know it's hard, especially for this competition. Uh, I, I, I will put my, if I project, and I'm, I'm gonna project here, 
I know that if I was in your position coming out of music school in this competition, I would totally feel like a poser. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I've never heard half of these and out half of these acronyms before. I have no idea what's going on. That's okay. Everybody starts somewhere. Be genuine. It is okay to not know everything. You want to have a conversation, right? At its core, sales engineering is a social career. It's one of the reasons why I love this job. So be humble. Follow through, but be humble. Be confident. If you make it to the meeting, there's a reason you're at the meeting. Right? You were good enough to get the job. You were good enough to get the meeting. Great. You can be confident in the knowledge that you're there for a reason. Don't be boastful or arrogant. Right? That all has to do with being genuine, making connections. That's how you build trust. Now, Dominic asked, at what point in the conversation with a business should you ask those questions? Okay, well, I didn't look at the question until too late. So I'm guessing, Dominic, that you are asking about this slide. Uh, let, me get, let me get rid of Cartman here. Um, these questions need timeline budget. They can be asked very early on. I've seen these questions asked. I've asked these questions sometimes in the first meeting. Okay, great. I understand you, you need a new disaster recovery solution because you're out of your lease in your colo facility. So we need to relocate that stuff and do something different. Awesome. When's that need to happen? Oh, the lease is up in December. So it needs to move pretty quickly. Do you already have a budget assigned for this? Okay, great. So, I mean, that, that can be handled those things, these things can be handled in the first meeting and they can be knocked out really, really quickly. This does not need to be a big deal here, right? Budget, timeline, customers expect to answer those questions. You are not crossing any boundaries by asking those questions. Now, these questions, I would say you wanna let your relationship and the opportunity mature, right? First meeting with Liberty Mutual on a potential $15 million, $20 million, $30 million deal, you're not gonna say, oh, okay, yeah. So who has to prove that? Who has signing authority? Can I meet with them? I'm sorry, who are you? We haven't even decided to do business with you yet, <laughs> right? So typically once it looks like, and I know that's a very squishy return, but once it looks like you, A, have something to offer and B, the customer is interested and then C, things are trending in the right direction. Yeah, at some point it's gonna be pretty obvious you need to know these things, right? So I would say these questions about budget, timeline and need, they can go very early. Um, most of your meetings will be about identifying the need, understanding the need, wrapping your arms around the need, solutioning the need. But budget and timeline could be asked very early on in the sales cycle. These questions really, you need to have a much more mature relationship with the customer and you need to know that you've got a shot at the deal. Um, because, you know, frankly, if you don't know, right? Once you, and I should say this too, once you have an established relationship with a customer, you only have to go through a large deal like this one time to know some of these things, right? So. Uh, if it's your first time dealing with a customer, you want to wait till the deal is mature enough and you've got enough trust with the customer that they'll share these things with you. So later in the sales cycle. And then if you do another deal with the customer, you're going to know a lot of these things. So there's one more question in the uh, Q&A. I know most places are becoming more diverse. We still have not gotten there in my experience. I, I would agree with you. Uh, how does one fight for a voice in the room if they believe they have a probing question? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so if you don't feel like you're getting time at the table, how do you get time at the table? That is a much more um, 
That's a much more delicate question. Uh, I, I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, as I've said, you know, you're going. I've never not been partnered. I've always had a a, a partner in the room, right? With um, with my sales rep. So, in my experience, that partner should be a good ally to you. And if you have a good relationship with your sales rep and you make sure that your sales rep understands your concerns going in, if they do their job right, they'll pass it to you. They will literally hand the conversation to you. I have had that happen innumerable times in my career. And I would say for me, that would be my first line of defense. Having an ally that knows what my concerns are or knows that I might have some concerns and can pass the ball to me, especially if you have the ability to express to that individual that you have concerns about being heard, right? So having an ally in the room is, you know, can be very, very helpful. Now, what happens if you don't have an ally? That's a great question. Um, which you didn't ask, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would say um, if you don't have an ally, there's always an opportunity to approach someone offline after the fact and try to make your voice heard. And I've certainly done that a number of times as well, right? If, if you don't get time at the table in the meeting and you don't have someone that is able to uh, intelligently pass you the ball, so to speak, during the meeting, then perhaps there's an opportunity to approach the individual that you have a question for after the meeting, either in person, over the phone, or via email. And then you work with your account rep to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And, and you know, <clears throat> since we had Gabby on just before this, I'll say it straight out, I'm a middle-aged white dude. Um, I have not been subject to those kinds of interactions nearly as much as some other people on the line here. I know that. But I have had my fair share of having to fight for my time at the table. Um, and, and those are the two techniques that I have used. So I, I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that helps to answer the question. And I'm sorry if it's not a, as complete an answer as I could possibly provide. So we got two minutes left. Um, I think I've got all the questions in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, yeah, Tom, thank you. That was a really great presentation. And uh, we really appreciate your time. This is gonna be super valuable for all the competitors. And uh, as Marjorie said, uh, she was saying that this, this would be valuable for even for <laughs> VMware SEs to, to look at this presentation. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> luckily we're recording this, so we will post this to YouTube uh, soon so that your teammates, for those of you who split up your teams to have one person go to uh, one of the workshops and the other person go to the other one, your teammate will be able to see this soon. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much again, Tom. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for, you, you are a judge, right? Uh, nope, I'm a mentor. You're a mentor. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for being a mentor as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's, let's end this because we do have to start the next one uh, right after this. Thank you so much.